Thank you. Thanks, John, for that gracious introduction and bringing me to Pullman. And thank you all for coming out on a late February afternoon in the middle of a semester. I understand that's not exactly prime time. Um, I've come to think of sport at its best as what I call a republic of play, a fair, transparent arena where one's performance matters more than their class, gender, racial background, where you measure your worth by the strength of your opponents. And sport celebrates the body, the mind, and being on a team. Because I think those of us who've been on a team where everybody had each other's back know that's one of the special experiences you can have in life. That republic of play ought a model of participatory democracy where everybody has access. But just as the early American Republic tolerated slavery alongside freedom, the Republic of Play can be a pretty mean and vicious place where youth are turned into disposable commodities on a global athletic supply chain, where the athletes we cheer are traumatized physically and neurologically. And sport can be used by opportunists to bring out the worst, not the best in us. I'd like to talk about that Republic of Play by talking about football in American Samoa and among the Samoan diaspora, the Samoans who moved from the islands in the South Pacific to Hawaii, to California, to the state of Washington and Utah. And I'd like to begin by showing you a brief trailer from a documentary that the Palomalu Foundation, Troy Palomalu, who's about to become the second Samoan inducted into Pro Football's Hall of Fame, and his wife, Theodora, are making. Um, and it's not just about football. It's called Songs of a Lost Island, and I think it poses the central question confronting Samoans in the American territory and in the migratory communities that have formed today. So, the first time that I officially played football, my earliest memories are my brother and I from what a distance learned how to walk playing football in our front yard. We would turn on the sprinklers, be tossing the ball, said, you know, you're Walter Payton, all right, and I'm the defense. We're in Soldier Field right now, and then that's how my passion for football started. Football has done so many things for me in my life. It's humbled me. It's taught me how to overcome adversity. It's pushed my body to the limit and how to overcome injuries, how to overcome haters. You know, I couldn't think of any other sport that could challenge my spirit and my body all in the same way. Samoa, you know what that means. That means that you've had a lot of discipline in your life. You've had to deal with a lot of uh, adversity. The Fa Samoa tradition is really based on love.
the one sentence I think captures the conflict. As the world changes, a seafaring people must find a path forward or face the end of an ancient way. Let me try to establish some context for that. Um, 2011, I just finished a couple of projects. I had no book to work on. Now, I know this probably sounds very strange, but I like having a book to work on. It's like running for me. If it's not there, I feel like something's missing. I also knew that I needed to get out of my comfort zone, and that led me to the South Pacific. It led Robert Louis Stevenson there, too, in the late 19th century. Stevenson, the best-selling novelist in Europe of the late 1800s, had been wandering the South Pacific, searching for a place where he could write and heal his brittle health when he arrived in Samoa in 1890. The author of Treasure Island and the Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Stevenson was a twitchy, chain-smoking mess. He had taken a pygmy schooner from Hawaii and was exhausted from the voyage. Storms almost sank the ship. The heat was stifling. For days on end, he stayed below deck, sitting up in his bunk, trying to write, spitting up blood, because he was ill. He didn't expect to find an Eden in Samoa, but that changed abruptly. He fell in love with the people, and I think you could see just enough of the landscape to understand why it would be an attractive place. It's quite stunning. He built a villa on the mountainside overlooking a Pia Harbor, and he was happy, but it wasn't enough to heal his riddled body, and he died there four years later and was buried atop the mountain. By then, he had come to understand Samoa like few foreigners, and he was beloved by Samoans like no other. They called him Tusi Tala, the teller of tales. He could have hardly found Samoans more simpatico. And for a Westerner, he could have hardly been less enamored with the influence of the West. He set to work learning their language, interrogating villagers about their folk ways and lives. He found the merry and easygoing living on land that had been communally owned by their extended family for centuries, in some case, millennia. He admired their chiefs, especially the high-talking chiefs, who entranced him with their storytelling about a, about a pre-modern past. We in the West, he said, are in the thick of the age of finance. They are in a period of communism, and that makes them hard to understand. But Stevenson feared for Samoa's future. After what he had witnessed in Hawaii, which saw a demographic wipeout of native islanders after Europeans arrived, he warned Samoans of a perilous future, their extinction by what he called our shabby civilization. He invited the chiefs, the Matai, to his villa. And he said, you and your children are in danger of being cast out into utter darkness, where shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I have seen these events, these judgments of God. I have seen them in Ireland and in the mountains of my own country, Scotland. Stevenson saw the tension between Western modernity and South Pacific tradition. He noted their religious devotion. He praised them as hardy cricketers, but he wasn't blind to their turbulent past. He described them as the contemporaries of our tattooed ancestors who drove their chariots on the wrong side of the Roman wall. And he used his pen, his most powerful weapon, to defend Samoans. He wrote a book called A Footnote to History, attacking Western countries, particularly the Germans, for what they had done in that set of islands. The German authorities were so upset about that that they impounded copies of the book when it was translated into German and brought there and burned them. After he died, his closest friend on the island said, to Samoans he was a prophet, honored as a man set apart from his fellows. But not even a prophet could have foretold Jesse Sapalu, Junior Seau, Troy Palamalu, Marcus Mariota, Tuatango Vailoa, and the eruption of Samoans on the world scene. Stevenson did not anticipate what would happen when those tattooed chariot drivers jumped the wall and brought their game, football and rugby, to the West. 
Stevenson called Polynesians God's best, at least their sweetest works. He wasn't thinking of Troy Polamalu. But by the 21st century, football coaches were, because there were scores of Polynesians, Samoans, some Tongans, Hawaiians, playing in the NFL, hundreds in Division I football, and many, many more in junior colleges and lesser level schools. That's from a population of 225,000 people, give or take about 55,000 of whom live in American Samoa, the rest California, Hawaii, the state of Washington, Utah, and the like. Meanwhile, boys born in independent Samoa, and there's two Samoas, I'll get to that, or in the Samoan migration from there to places like New Zealand, are dominant in rugby, including the New Zealand national team, the All Blacks. I don't think there's another microculture of sporting excellence, a place that's produced so many disproportionately talented athletes per capita than Samoa in football and in rugby. In the National Football League, there's something like 40 times overrepresented compared to any other group. Now, Troy Palomalu was at the peak of his career when I first went to Samoa in 2011. Troy almost disappears off the field. He defers to elders all the time. But when he was on the field, he was the center of attention, not just the hair or the random way he ran around the field like a wild man, but somehow knew just what was going to happen, but his ability to alter a game on any given play. Early in the 2010 season, when Pittsburgh would return to the Super Bowl for Palomalu's, the Steelers' third time when Palomalu was with the club, Early in that season, Pittsburgh is playing the Tennessee Titans. Titans complete a long pass. They get the ball in the Steelers' two-yard line. Time is running out. The Titans rush to the line of scrimmage. Kerry Collins gets behind the center. Palomalu, meanwhile, is standing in the middle of the backfield, perfectly still. And then, all of a sudden, he takes three quick steps forward, leaps over the line of scrimmage, timing it beautifully so that he wasn't offside, two feet over the offensive lineman, and lands on Collins just as Collins is getting the ball. Collins collapses. He looks up at Troy and says, great play, dude. Well, it was. It displayed his physical abilities, his intellect. He, he knew what Tennessee was likely to do, given the game situation. He had studied them. He knew what the possibilities were. He also knew that if he was offside, it's only half the distance to the goal line. And his courage to act decisively in a moment. But what I later realized about Palomalu and his approach to sport and his sense of humility, which is about the highest compliment Samoans can pay each other, was how rooted it was in Fa'a Samoa, the way of Samoa. Some backstory. There are two Samoas the football-playing independent territory of American Samoa and independent Samoa, which is rugby-playing. Uh, altogether, it's only a million people, including their diaspora to New Zealand, Australia, and the U.S. American Samoa is about as far away as you can get from the mainland of the United States, two-thirds of the way from Los Angeles to New Zealand. Samoans have been living in this group of islands, and they're tiny, for about 3,000 years. They were renowned for tangling with other islanders, particularly Tongans. Uh, they could navigate the sea without the equipment anybody else would need. When the Europeans arrived in the late 1800s, Europeans did not do very well. Samoans were a tough, combative people. That changed a bit when the London Missionary Society arrived in the 1830s and these evangelical congregationalists converted the chiefs, the Matai, who then brought their extended families, the Ainga, into the fold. Christianity, many people have told me, blunted the violence. But clashes between villages persisted into the 20th century and European interference upped the body count because now you had guns and the like. 
Christianity Today encompassing all sorts of evangelicals, congregationalists, Mormons, Catholics, has tightened its grip. At dusk every day, a group called the Village Society of Untitled Men get in the back of a pickup truck and drive around blowing conch shells, announcing saw that it's time to go home and pray. One day I started a run a little late in the day, and as I approached the village of Matu'u, where the Palomalus were from on that island, I see all these guys with big sticks smacking these propane tanks hanging from an L-shaped wooden thing that had been used in the old days to announce tsunamis. Now they announce saw. As I get close, the guy holds the stave parallel to the ground and points to the ground. Sit, which of course I did until saw was over. Now the islands were a backwater until the late 19th century when the European countries in the United States are trying to divide the world into zones of influence. That almost started a global war. The European powers, Germany, the Brits, the United States, came to their senses and divided up these islands among themselves without bloodshed and, of course, without asking the Samoans to have a say in what was going on. So that's why you have two Samoas, what was German Western Samoa, and eventually independent, and the American territory. It's a 30-minute flight apart. One language, one culture, although they're on different sides of the international date line. And in Samoa, they drive on the other side of the road. Both of that is to help them because their economy and lives are much more aligned with New Zealand than the United States. Driving, by the way, is incredibly mellow. There's no road rage. The maximum speed limit's about 25 miles an hour, and people obey it. And for all the abandon with which they throw their bodies around on the football field, they baby their cars. They're very cautious drivers. It's, it's pretty interesting. Now, the United States was ambivalent about annexing more territory, but it wanted a coaling station and a harbor on the way to China. But as soon as we signed a deal with the chiefs, we had already fought a war with Spain over the Philippines, and we had better ways to get to China. And about the same time, oil replaced coal, so we didn't need a coaling station. That meant the United States basically forgot about American Samoa. We install a governor, but we spent as little as possible. And Samoans did not get the riches they were hoping for. Mexicans often lament they're so far from God and close to the United States. Samoans might celebrate that they're so close to God and far from the United States. The chiefs cut a good deal. They might not have gotten the riches, but they got three guarantees. One was that land could not be sold to foreigners. Land is owned by these collective extended families. It's not private property. Now that drives entrepreneurs crazy, but it means that if you belong to an Einga, an extended family, you will always have a home. And because the Aingas not only have the follies, these thatched roof, open-sided dwellings to live in, they have land on the hillside, they've got their plantation, so you always have something to eat. You will never be homeless nor hungry if anybody has food. Secondly, the chiefs retained their titles. And there are high chiefs, paramount chiefs, high-talking chiefs and the like. They're chosen collectively by the extended family and can be removed by the extended family. Their authority shapes daily life. They say, you farm today, you fish, you build follies, and then they divide the catch up and apportion it by need. They're not so critical now that a cash economy and wage labor has replaced subsistence agriculture and fishing. But if there is a wedding, a funeral, a ceremony, if something needs to be done, they tell you what you will contribute. And when there's a conflict or a fight, including fights over football or rugby, they settle them. The third guarantee was that Fa'a Samoa, the way of Samoa, would prevail, unless it's in conflict with US law. Fa'a Samoa revolves around mutual obligations. 
respect for elders, including preachers, teachers, and coaches. It inculcates youth with a sense of responsibility and discipline. Shame matters. You do not embarrass your family, your village, your church. Rap videos are sweet anthems to school and family. Everybody smiles. I often think about Polynesians as God's best, at least his sweetest works, when I'm there. And if you act out, if you shame your family or your village, it's not just your mother and your father. It's all your aunties and uncles, and you have a lot of them, and your teachers and your preachers and your coaches who are going to go upside your head. Now, this sense of Fa'asamoa drives sport because it is, at its core, competitive. But it also stresses service, what they call tatua. You give back. It's not just about me. It's about we. The former deputy of director of Samoan Affairs, which is responsible for maintaining Fa'a Samoa, spoke to me right after Troy Palomalu did his first football camp on the island. I was there a couple of weeks later. There were terrible towels all over the island. And he said Palomalu's visit is tatua, it's service, it's give back. While Palomalu was there, they brought him to the Starkist Tuna Cannery, which is the biggest private employer on the island. And they stopped the assembly line, which is unusual. So the workers could have a service and pray and sing and do traditional dance for Troy, who's a total softy. He breaks down in tears. Then they take him outside. I don't know if you can remember when Starkist Tuna had as, had as its icon of advertising, Charlie the Tuna? Well, outside the main gate of the tuna factory, you had a 12-foot wooden totem of Charlie the Tuna. But when they brought Troy out, it was Troy the Tuna, with long flowing black hair, fins, and a Steeler jersey with the number 43. I'm not sure what anthropologists would make of that. And if you studied anthropology, you know that's where Margaret Mead wrote Coming of Age in Samoa in the 1920s. But they agree that the system of land tenure, the chiefs, and Fa'a Samoa, what's been called communism in its most perfect form, have allowed Samoans to avoid the demolition of traditional culture, which has savaged most islands and most cultures in the South Seas. By the early 20th century, the British introduced rugby, and cricket, as well as notions of muscular Christianity, that sport would build courage and teamwork and manliness and discipline. Well, muscular Samoa trampled muscular Christianity. The Samoans took the British game of cricket, and they renamed it. They called it Kirikiki. And instead of playing 11 on a side, everybody got a chance to play. Stephen saw, Stevenson saw it everywhere when he rode his horse, Jack, around the island. But the players weren't wearing pressed white flannels. This was an English village cricket. It was more like pre-industrial England's football, when hundreds of people went at it with no rules and no referees, and there were a lot of broken bones and blood. As Stevenson wrote, cricket matches were 100 played on a side, endured at times for weeks, and ate up the country like the presence of an army. The British consul described processions on match day as fearful and wonderful behold, as teams march in swaggering military order to the beat of penny whistles and drums, shouldering bats as though they were war clubs. Players were exhorted to battle for their teams. And each time a guy on the other side made an out, there'd be five minutes of raucous celebration from the players and the people in the village. Germans ought to have paid more attention. If they had seen how hard they played, they might have understood how hard they were going to fight. Because for Samoans, sport could be as rough as war. You played it with what they called no fei fei, no fear. When you challenged another village to a kiri match, you sent your high talking chief and all the formality and rigor of ceremony as you prepared for war. And I think sport crystallized the conflict between Samoan and Western goals. Samoans 
are not seeking to maximize production. They're seeking to minimize effort and maximize leisure. One anthropologist wrote, Samoans say that life is good because it is easy. The ease with which the necessities of life are obtained gives much leisure time. Conditions favoring the elaborate development of ceremonial and pleasure activities. I mean, if you're able to get your fruit and your food from the hillside and your fish from the sea and you have no refrigeration, there's not a big stress to have more and more stuff. Westerners, however, deplored what they called tropical communism, and it wasn't a compliment. A German governor had this to say, the natives are ignorant, they have to be instructed. They're lazy and have to learn to work. They're dirty and have to be washed. But when World War I began, the Germans surrendered and the Samoans prevailed. Today, kirikiki is still played. It's played with mirth more than ferocity. Men, women, and the fa'afafini, men who live in the way of women, known as the third gender, who are a very respected group in Samoan society, all play. All I had to do was ask somebody about kirikiki, and I'd get a smile, which frankly is not a terribly difficult thing to do as Samoans. Every time you pass a three-year-old girl to an 80-year-old girl, you're getting a wide smile. Now, the Brits also introduced rugby, which has become independent Samoa's national sport. And their national team, Manu Samoa, are their ambassadors to the world. And they play in Japan, in England, in France, in Ireland, and, of course, in New Zealand, where many of them were their descendants of Samoan migrants to New Zealand are on the All Blacks, the greatest rugby squad in the world. But no matter what sport you're talking about, it is highly competitive. Part of a competitive culture in which people vied for prestige, for land, for power. Now, given you've got rugby and cricket already entrenched, it's kind of amazing that American football managed to gain a foothold. But World War II was a game changer. After Pearl Harbor, Pongo Pongo Harbor, after, excuse me, the attack on Pearl Harbor, Pongo Pongo, the harbor of American Samoa, became a staging ground for the Allied counterattack. Most of the major island that you were looking at is surrounded by coral reef. But Pongo Pongo Harbor is the caldera, the cone of a volcano. So it is deep and it is huge. The island itself is only about 19 miles long, four or five miles wide. It shoots up out of the sea because it's a volcanic uplift, and it's slathered in green. During the war, U.S. troops outnumbered Samoans. Uh, the military flooded the island with cash, eroding fishing and farming and village life. Wage labor replaced subsistence agriculture and what you could harvest from the bounty of the sea. Villagers were forced out of um, their homes so the troops could stay there. Others were conscripted to work for the military or enlisted. The war exposed Samoans to Americans on a daily basis, and Samoans became fierce American patriots. Not only are they highly overrepresented in football, more than any other group, they are the most overrepresented demographic in the US military. Every family I've ever talked with had military people past, present, and future. It also exposed U.S. servicemen to Samoan women. And at the end of the war, there were hundreds of babies that had been born um, to these relationships. And then after the war in 1951, the U.S. Navy shut its base down. And the economy <coughs> fell into a depression. The military, to ease the pain, told anybody who worked for the military or was in the military that they and their family could have free passage and work at military bases in Hawaii or California. And about 2,000 of the 12,000 people on the island left. As one older man said, it was like a morgue when they left. You didn't know if you'd see any of them again. But that created Samoan communities in Hawaii and California, usually around military bases. Pearl Harbor, Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, California, Fort Lewis in Washington, Long Beach Naval Yards in California. The sons 
of that exodus gravitated to football. And they are the ones who create what becomes known as the Polynesian Pipeline. Now, the first Samoans to play football in the United States were not a part of that. They were actually a little earlier. How many of you have been to Oahu? Okay. If you've gone up to the North Shore where the surfing is, you'll pass the Polynesian Cultural Center, uh, Brigham Young, Laie, a town called Laie. And a little north of there, a town called Kahuku. That's where the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints built their first temple outside the mainland, which is a very important place for baptism and certain things to occur if you want your soul in perpetuity in the embrace of the church. They brought Samoans there as laborers, Samoan Mormons. They stayed. It built up a community. That's the reason why Kahuku, the high school they go to, is one of the most amazing stories in high school football. One of those schools that year after year will have more players in the NFL than just about anybody else. The first Samoan to play in the NFL, Alapati Al Lolotai, born in independent Samoa, then German Western Samoa, lived in American Samoa, comes with his mother after his father dies to Laie to work on the temple. He will, in 1945, debut with the Washington Redskins. He was much more famous because nobody paid attention. Oh, the first Samoan in the NFL. This is not Jackie Robinson two years later. It's nothing. He was much better known because he was the tag team wrestling partner, and was an excellent wrestler, with Dwayne The Rock Johnson's grandfather. And he would later go back to American Samoa and organize a sporting life there. Now, he was an outlier. So was the next Samoan in the NFL, Charlie Ani, who captained the Detroit Lions in the 50s when they were winning the NFL title. He had gone to the Punahou School in Honolulu, where Barack Obama played basketball. But by the 60s, a sizable Samoan community has developed, particularly in Honolulu. One high school, Farrington, sends Jesse Sapalu to the San Francisco 49ers, wins four Super Bowl rings. Baba Pisa, a two-time uh, All-American at Michigan State. The Nonga brothers, Falanico, Pete, and Al, they never lifted weights. We didn't know about steroids in those days. They did have Taro. These guys had bodies that were sculpted like Greek gods. All of these guys played at University of Hawaii, except for Apisa, and then in the NFL. And by the 60s and 70s, high school football in California and Hawaii around military bases with Polynesians was kicking butt. A dozen of these schools have incubated the most players. Punahou, Kahuku, the St. Louis School in Honolulu where Marcus Mariota, the first Heisman Trophy winner from Samoa, and Tua Tango Vailoa is going to be a top five draft pick, I suspect, quarterback to Alabama, played. Long Beach Poly, Juju Smith-Schuster, Oceanside, um, Junior Seau. They became conduits to schools like USC, BYU, Hawaii, Oregon, and of course, Washington State. Jack Thompson, Samoa Samoa, Destiny Veao, Daniel Ekuali, Hercules Matafata, Frankie Luvo, Logan Tongo, Shalom Luani, Frederick Maogoa, and many others. And you're going to see more of them with uh, Nick Rolovich, who really rebuilt Hawaiian football by using Polynesians. I think you're going to see a lot of these kids here. Now, the very best and the very luckiest advance to the NFL. It's striking how many of these guys are from families not only where Fa'a Samoa is still the rule, but are from religious families and military families. You want to talk about a perfect storm of discipline. It's one of the reasons why coaches love having these kids. They are also apparently the center of almost every locker room because players of different races, nationalities, seem to gravitate to them. Now, I remember my first day in American Samoa. I had stupidly 
not understood I should stop in Hawaii and spend a couple of days. So it took me 24 hours and three flights to get from Pittsburgh to Pongo. And the next day I'm kind of woozy, sort of like I was when I got into Pullman last night on Eastern Standard Time at one in the morning. And I'm trying to make sense of what I'm seeing. Kids jogging to football practice in late July, carrying helmets, scrimmaging for four hours in the sun, not stopping in big storms. And I'm thinking, aha, this is just like the Dominican Republic, a place I kind of know. It's football, not baseball. They speak Samoan, not Spanish. It's south of the equator, not north of the equator. But I mean, Dominican Republic, an island, uh, shares an island of Hispaniola with Haiti, 10 million people, 10% of all major leaguers, a third of all minor leaguers. That's kind of ridiculous. A couple of weeks later, I realized how wrong I was. Samoans were never enslaved. They're never colonized. They don't have their islands changed by uh, colonial plantations. They never lost their independence or their autonomy. And I don't know if you can think of too many groups of people who can say that for 3,000 years, we've been running the show for ourselves. Football arrived in American Samoa in the late 60s. The byproduct of all things of a Reader's Digest article which called American Samoa, America's shame in the South Seas. Remember, this is the Cold War. And this writer is describing government buildings rotting on their foundations. Outhouses built on piers into Pongo Pongo Harbor, dropping fecal matter into the water. A verdant island that has to import canned goods to feed its people an island that gets 150 inches of rain or more a year and it doesn't have enough drinking water, and a public education system that allowed only 24 boys and girls to go beyond eighth grade. Well, John Kennedy is taking office. Cold War is raging. He sees this as an embarrassment. And what resulted was territory building. Funds were pumped in. A public television system is built. Schools are built. The roads are improved. The public television system wasn't very effective educating people, but it exposed Samoans to Davy Crockett, uh, the I Love Lucy show, and football. The first game that was shown was the 1966 game of the century between undefeated Notre Dame and Michigan State. Bunch of all Americans, two undefeated teams, played a scoreless tie. That was the first game shown live in Hawaii. And a week later, when the films arrived, it was shown in American Samoa. And all eyes were on Bob Apisa, who had grown up on the island, then gone uh, to Farrington High School, and then Michigan State, who later, uh, football career was ended because of new injuries. You might have seen him in the original Hawaii 5 -0. He became a stuntman. Same Reader's Digest writer came back four years later and said, wow, this is America's showplace of the South Seas. It's changed from a Pacific slum to a Polynesian paradise in four years. American culture arrives with every flight, with everything shown on TV. America becomes real. It becomes tangible, not this distant aberration. And once football was introduced in the late 60s, boys took to it. They loved its roughness which didn't seem very rough because they had grown up playing rugby. Now in football, you've got equipment. And many of them told me it made them feel American. It made them feel close to what they were seeing on TV. They're the boys who create the island games traditions, including playing on the field of champions. On one side, you have the mountains, beautiful. On the other, the ocean. The field itself is kind of like this. And there's chunks of lava, volcanic rock, as big as a golf ball, embedded in the dirt. So when you play, you're not only getting hit by other players, you're getting ground into the rock. But as one man who played uh, football in the United States and then there said to me, if you quit or refuse to play there, you will never, ever live it down. 
your grandchildren will hear stories of your shame. Now, by the 80s, football is becoming a ticket off the island, and for a few, the pros. Most of the boys in Division I are not from the island directly, although Washington State had a kid, Destiny Veau, a couple of years ago, who was right off the island. Most are from the population, second, third generation, living in the States, or they're kids who leave the island, finish their education in Hawaii or California, and then go to college. Most of them who play in junior colleges and the like never make it to Division I. But those who do have a very good chance of ending up playing on Sundays. And that makes Samoans a unique source of talent. Look at baseball, basketball, and hockey. From 25% up are kids who grew up outside the United States. Samoans really are the only group in the National Football League. The Tongans you see in the NFL did not learn football in Tonga. They learned it in Utah, Hawaii, and elsewhere. How come? Gabe Sewell, a teacher and coach, said this, it means much more now than when I played in the 1980s. Parents nowadays know what's at stake in terms of education. My parents' generation was skeptical. Do you eat that ball, they said. Gabe has several sons playing in college, one at Nevada, uh, one at Oregon, a tackle, Panay Sewell, who was the Outland Trophy winner for the best lineman in the country, and co-winner uh, with Tuatango Vailoa for the Polynesian Hall of Fame Football Player of the Year. You will see him on Sundays very soon. By the 80s, football is a way off the rock, as the island is called. The way to get a college degree. Now, the reason that matters is that if you have a college degree, you stand a much better chance getting a job with the island government. And that's the best job. You don't want to work in the tuna cannery. You don't want to work on the hillside plantations. But the other thing is, when you get that degree, it's not only you that's honored. You honor your village, your extended family, your church. And it means a lot to people. As Mel Purcell, a high-talking chief, said, the greater success comes when they are walking across the stage with degree in hand, not on the field. Two of his sons played in the NFL. Now, why do you have so many talented athletes coming from such a tiny place? Part of that is global capitalism. It's going to find talent. It's going to inject resources. It's going to incentivize play. But I don't think capitalism is the entire story behind excellence and meaning in sport. Certainly not the most uplifting one. Samoans have put their own mark on the game. It matters to them. And I think the communities that produce the best athletes, one of the reasons is because sport means something to that community, to black Americans, to Brazilians, to Kenyan runners. Now, Samoans have redefined the game. Now, they are physically imposing. You don't want to be seated in between two Samoans on a long flight. I guarantee you that. But their exploits are not due to some inherent natural superiority. They're the end product of a deeply embedded culture confronting the 21st century. They're a warrior people who live by an age-old code and play football the way George Orwell, 1984, described English football. War minus the shooting. Samoans once prized taking heads in battle, but the hakas and siva taos they perform before games now are ceremonial and psychological. But there is a warrior spirit. They risk their bodies every time out, just the way they have risked their bodies in Iraq and Afghanistan. Their capacity to tolerate pain is stunning but it also places them in a very vulnerable situation in football. Now, if you look at all the sports in this country, football is probably the most rationalized and specialized, which depends on the most resources. I mean, think how many coaches there are in a football squad, for example. Think of all the different training and techniques and the like. The best football tends to be played where you have the most resources. 
not Samoans. They got nothing. The first generation didn't have equipment. They shared helmets and shoes, even mouth guards. Uh, their coaches had never played the game. They learned about how to coach football by reading about football. Coaching and infrastructure are improving. Training, unfortunately, is virtually year-round, which exposes them to more subconcussive damage. But this is nothing like the Dominican Republic with baseball academies or a good high school program or football academies in Europe. Samoan teams lack just about everything. Fanga Itua, the kids on the cover of my book, play in a field full of water with toads big enough to tackle you. I'm at one uh, practice with a coach named Potty Potty, who's also the choir and music teacher. And there are dogs chasing his players when they're doing laps. And Potty says, those are my speed coaches. I've had these speed coaches chase me. They caught me. Now, it doesn't hurt there are big people playing a sport where size matters. But despite all the research, the anthropologists, the epidemiologists have not been able to isolate genes that would suggest why they might be so good at football. Uh, one anthropologist, epidemiologist at Brown, who's been studying them for decades, says there is solid evidence that Samoans have more lean tissue, muscle mass, and bone. But does that explain their success as interior linemen and explosive speed? I don't know. Nobody's gone that far. I think it's trivial against the larger background issues. What are those issues? Well, there are not a lot of alternatives for kids growing up. If you don't get that education, you, you have to get off the rock. The second biggest employer, the option for kids coming out of high school is the military. And Samoans always far exceed their quota. But it's also, I think, because of Fa'a Samoa and this transoceanic culture that Samoans have. If you're a kid in a Samoan family, you have no shortage of football role models. I would wager that nine out of 10 Samoans who play football in college have a father, an uncle, brothers, nephews, cousins that play the game as well. You acquire confidence that you can do it. Like you grow up in a house of doctors or lawyers, you think, well, I can do that. You grow up in a family of football players, I can do that too. Plus you're getting the snot kicked out of you by your older brothers all the time, so you better learn how to do it. There's also that commitment to service. Palomalu's been back half a dozen times. He has spent millions trying to develop athletic skills for boys and girls, literacy skills, public health, computer skills, making that documentary. Other men and women uh, help kids with their SATs and college applications. And remember, they have spoken Samoan growing up. So they're dealing with all this often in English as a second language. And also, they benefit from intense rivalries and coaches willing to make that six-hour flight from Honolulu and then six-hour flights back to recruit. So what's the payoff? Well, the NFL, the not-for-long league, you don't last long. But that education, which I think is important. Now, it's also true, I think, that football and rugby have branded Samoans around the world. The success of Mariota, of Tua, of Seau, of Troy, of Jesse, builds up this collective self-esteem. The way Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, Henry Aaron, Roy Campanella, Satchel Paige did before and after integration. And that collective pride is a powerful force. It means that football tells a Samoan story to the world about people who work hard and play harder, who persevere and never, ever quit, and in the end become the, the, among the best at what they do. They also have that warrior tradition. A high-talking chief said, the same instincts you feel as a football player were those you felt as a warrior battling for your village. Now, Open warfare has disappeared, but you still have people fighting over land and chiefly titles and over football. One of the last games I went there, it got a little chippy on the field. A player got thrown out. 
His mother couldn't stand that. She riles up the other mothers. And soon, there's a horde of Samoan mothers, bigger than their sons, led by the priest who gave the invocation before the game, charging onto the field. Needless to say, it was suspended. And if you're on the visiting team, you know the drill when you get back on the bus. You put your helmet on and you put your windows down so that when you get rocked on the way out of Dodge, the glass doesn't break and get you. The media caricatures Samoans as wild-haired warriors willing to hit, and they are. They're willing to sacrifice. They're willing to endure pain. As one coach said, we revere the warrior. Our attitude is that I'm not afraid of anything. I'm going to conquer whatever comes in my way, and that includes the kid on the other side of the line of scrimmage. And coaches like to talk about the sound when Samoans hit on the line. But a stronger motivation is fear of failure. Gabe Sewell, you're taught from when you're little that when you leave the island, you take the name of the family, village, and religious community with you. You carry the hopes and dreams of the whole island. You know your parents and grandparents are constantly praying for you to succeed. You cannot let them down. And that name, Tuiasa Sopo, Seau, Palamalu, Moyagoa, there's a lot of people carrying that name. Now, here's the catch. It's not a given that kids on the island or in the diaspora are going to hold on to the language and to the culture. Wage work is the norm. Riding a bus, not walking, is happening. Children don't do as many daily chores. In other words, daily life is threatening the foundation of Fa'a Samoa. Older men, I think, grew up what I describe as Samoan strong. Big chores every day, climbing up the hillside, which is really steep, carrying 100 pounds uh, on their back, walking everywhere, uh, walking in bare feet or wearing flip-flops. Kids today still do that, walking, have chores, use, wear flip-flops, and they do a lot of traditional dance. So they're very agile, light on their feet. They come to college, they put on 60 or 70 pounds, and all of a sudden the guy who is a wide receiver is a tackle or a defensive lineman. But lifestyle is changing. Nowhere is that more egregious than in diet. There are two McDonald's on the island. They're open 24-7. They're among the two highest grossing McDonald's in the world. A couple of years ago, there were stats. These stats are about 10 years old, so they're probably worse. 47% of adults in American Samoa, according to the World Health Organization, are diabetic. 47%. The dialysis unit is open 17 hours a day, and it can't meet its needs. 90% are overweight or obese. And 99% are at risk because of some life, diet, lifestyle issue. And that's a problem, I think, in cultures where you have the greatest concentration of athletic talent, you also often have the worst public health demographics. Look at African Americans. Disproportionate number of talented athletes, but lower life expectancy, higher incidence of diabetes than the population at large. Education is a second concern. Many kids who go off island don't last long. Many avoid returning. As one woman said, not Getting that degree is like not finishing a tattoo. Traditional tattoo goes from your groin to your ankle. It takes a week. If you've had a tattoo, you know they can be painful. But you haven't had a tattoo where the tattooist is using a, a mallet and using a boar's tooth while two helpers stretch the skin so it can be inked. And after two or three or four days, people, no more. But you carry that half a tattoo with you as a mark of shame. Third, there's the damage football inflicts. Samoans are stoic to the point of denial. They don't admit that they're hurt. They, Troy Palomalu later said when we stopped playing, oh, yeah, I had many more concussions than I ever admitted to. How many of you have had a baseline uh, concussion impact test? 
They don't do that in the islands. Players half my age and twice my weight walk with difficulty. They don't want to talk about concussions. Last time I was there, I talked to two high school football teams. I said, how many have concussion? Put up your hand. Nobody put up their hand. I'm not sure they know what concussions are. The bottom line, Samoans finessed political contact with the West, but their culture is under duress. Now, I think American football is at a crossroads. The number of kids playing high school Pop Warner ball is plummeting. Where you see kids holding on to football are among lower socioeconomic areas and Polynesians. Football is their story to the world, but that narrative is bittersweet. They pay a price, physically and neurologically, for their devotion to the game. Nobody lived and died that irony more than Junior Seau. He played 20 years in the NFL. He had more pain-killing injections, I believe, than all of us put together. He played with fractured bones, a perennial all-pro. When he retired around the age of 40, he lived in Oceanside where he grew up. He went surfing, um, lived across from the beach, played his ukulele, led kids in informal exercise sessions on the beach. And then things got bad, because chronic traumatic encephalopathy catches up with you. His behavior became erratic. He started abusing Ambien. His relations fell apart. He drove his SUV off a small cliff, somehow survived. Finally, he went into his guest bedroom, lay down in best bed, and shot himself in the chest so that when they did an autopsy, they could see if there was CTE. Seau is an example of the tragic consequence of playing with no fei-fei. Now let me end with just one more comment. Robert Louis Stevenson was long dead before football debuted, but he could see the handwriting on the wall. And in 1894, he invited the Matai to come to his villa. And he said, if they did not reclaim their land, others surely would. It will not continue to be yours or your children." I see that the day has come now of the great battle by which it shall be decided whether you are to pass away or to stand fast and have your children living on and honoring your memory in the land you received of your fathers. Now is the time for the true champions of Samoa to stand forth. Now he didn't want them just to go to battle with the Germans and get killed. He wanted them to hold on to their culture and tradition every which way they could because he anticipated how difficult it would be for that seafaring people to find a path forward in a changing world and avoid the end of an ancient way. Well, I think we need to do the same. In this country, when it comes to sport, we see the damage sport inflicts, its false promises, but we know how uplifting it can be. What it can do for individuals, what it can do for towns, for schools, how much it can build social capital. And I think we can use it to build that republic of play, sport at its best. And I think it's time for the champions of sport to stand forth. You know, we're in a pretty dicey time in this country. And your generation is going to be the most affected by that, the decisions that are made. Because you're going to have to live it out. We're seeing the gains of the civil rights movement reversed. We're seeing white supremacy on the march. Well. I think we can use sport to counter some of that. Because sport's a way to talk with people, to bring people together, to encourage healthy lifestyles, connect us. And that's because sport matters to most people. They want it to be fair. They want it to be democratic. And I think we can make that republic of play a model for society. You know, I'm a lot older than you guys. But I came of age at a time when there was a sense of change that people could change the world for the better. And I think that's the challenge of your time. I'm not necessarily arguing you should go to the barricades or join any particular political cause. But if you care about sport, start there. Thank you very much for your attention. So now the floor is open for anybody who has a question for Dr. Rook. If you have a loud voice like me, 
sass. If not, there's a mic over there. If not, there'll be a test. <laughs> no questions. Well, thank you for coming. Oh, 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 go ahead. What was your favorite memory of someone, of someone? Well. The question is, what is your favorite memory of someone, just in case you didn't hear it? You know, I've been there five or six times. Um, I think you, you work pretty hard when you're there tracking down people. Um, but I recall one day, and it doesn't matter if it's Sunday or not. People are in church and people are singing. And there are many, many churches in every village. And I'm on the beach, sort of half in the water, and I'm, I'm looking at this absolutely stunning mountainside of green, and I'm hearing these songs being sung from the sanctuary. And you know, I'm not a particularly religious person, but that was a spiritual moment as I'll ever have. Other questions? What's your favorite meal you had out there? McDonald's. Yeah. Um, I'm a runner. I'm not a football player. And Samoan meals are really starchy, often fried. Um, at a Samoan wedding, as one person told me, it's the only wedding you'll go to where every guest brings home a wedding cake, as well as several pounds of food. Um, but the tuna is terrific. And there's also, they do these things called the tonai, which is the Sunday feast, where they dig a hole in the ground an oven called an umu, line it with hot rocks, and then they put all this different kinds of food, like a dozen different things, meats, fish, vegetables, and the like, cover it over, and it cooks. Go there just for that. Have there any, been any efforts recently to like try to take concussions of CT seriously? You know, the first time I went, I came back and uh, talked to the people at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, who made available the baseline concussion impact test for free. They do webinars. I couldn't get the coaches to do it. Um, you know, the NFL could take pocket change and improve the safety and health of that island. Um, how many of you have played football? Okay, you know that the helmets you played with are tested and evaluated and discarded when they're no good. Not Samoan helmets. Um, basic safety things. You know, and of course getting the NFL to do something that's for the community and not just PR is a difficult thing. But if you've got a connection, I think that'd be a really good thing to press them with, to do right by this demographic, which has done so much for them. This is an area where you know far more than I do. Um, but what I heard from a lot of people in Laie and Kahuku, um, including this one fellow who is uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's cousin and stunt double, um, Tonai Reed, whose son plays uh, for the University of Virginia football team after Kahuku. He said, you know, there are certain things in the church, the Mormon church says we shouldn't do, but I'm Samoan. 
I believe a tattoo is something that's coming out of my spirit. So the church says no tattoo, but I will have a tattoo. Uh, or his mother um, smoked cigarettes. And I think that was something she wasn't to do. So I think, you know, oftentimes when part of a culture, a religion, a sport, goes to a different part of the world, it changes. Um, just the way Cubans made baseball their game, or Brazilians made European football their game, um, people want to control their own lives and have an influence. That's a really interesting point you raise. So you mentioned the tattoo that they have from the, the groin to the ankle. What does that necessarily like, symbolize for everyone? Uh, the, it's called a PEA, P, little accent mark, E-A. Um, and I think that's like a commitment to Fa'a um, And, you know, it's not just a band on your shoulder or a couple of little things. I mean, it is the full Monty. And they're, they're really impressive looking uh, when you see that on people. Um, but that's about the depth of my knowledge on tattoos, and probably about as deep as religion. Yeah. Um, well, Jesse Sapalu, who's a bit older, um, the four-time Super Bowl winner, has been very important in organizing the Polynesian Football Hall of Fame and has worked a lot with Troy. So has Troy's uncle, Kennedy, uh, who's coached in the NFL and in colleges. Um, um, from the island, long reddish brown hair. He played for Denver. Um, the lineman, defensive lineman. Uh, um, right. Uh, Pecco Damata, Damata Pecco, uh, has done a lot. Um, but I think that, you know, it, it's like a Dominican who makes it in baseball or a Kenyan runner, you know. Given the per capita income, your wealth is extraordinary. And you have that sense of responsibility in many cases uh, to help other people. And I think that uh, probably most of the guys who've made it and lasted more than a season in the NFL have supported and given back in different ways. Um, a lot of them go back and coach. and. You know, I've been around a lot of college coaches, and I'm highly skeptical about a lot of college coaches. So I really have a high estimation of Nick Rolovich, your new coach. Um, but I have seen so many high school co football coaches on the island and in Hawaii and in Oceanside, California, who I found extraordinarily dedicated. I mean, they're not getting paid. They can pay maybe $2,000 a year, which and they spend more out of their own pocket for their kids. And their, I mean, their summers, their afternoons, I mean, a tremendous commitment. Their service, their tattoo. Well, once again, thank you all for coming. Well, time to do a book session, a signing session if you want to. <clears throat>